they are under. Oh, and the second keynote that I just called. <laughs> uh, the first one was about uh, 60 slides per uh, second. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, Smarty McCarthy. I should probably start by quoting um, Edward R. Murrow, who uh, in his 1956 RTMDA speech started by saying, this just might not do any of us any good. Um, I hope it will as well. So uh, it's good to be here. It's always good to be at this conference uh, more than any other country that I attend. It's kind of like coming home to come here. What? Uh, uh, yeah, there's another one I'm starting to like a lot as well. But um, but at the same time, uh, coming up on the stage is always a reminder that we have work to do. Uh, this year, more than any of the previous years, we have work to do. Uh, in part, that's perhaps because in previous years we were a bit too lighthearted about the work that we need to do, or too blasé, or too busy doing other things. And, heck, I'm as guilty about uh, that as any of you are, but we really need to talk about this seriously this time. So, the work that we need to do uh, needs to be done for reasons that, you know, doesn't really need any introduction in this group. Uh, but I'm going to try and talk a bit about that work and about knowing and about acting, and I'm going to try and talk a little bit about fascism, though not really in the sense that we normally use that word. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the distinction between technology and politics and how we allowed ourselves to be convinced by the fascists that such a uh, distinction actually existed. And even those of us that uh, were very much aware of the political implications of technology are often very blind to the implications of those politics. And of course I'm going to try and make um, some sense of what all of this has to do with free software. But this has been a very, very good year for knowing. We now know many things that we were not supposed to know, that those who intended us not to know them uh, were very serious about keeping from us. We also know that there is much more that we will soon know, and those who do not want us to know these things are struggling to figure out how to keep this knowledge from us. Their goal is ultimately to deter uh, determine in which way they can cut off free speech without seeming to do so. In England, where I'm now living, uh, there are discussions about how to prosecute those who know the things that we should know. Uh, how to cause David Miranda to be rendered permanently persona non grata for the sole crime of having passed through a, an airport transit lounge. All is not as it should be right now. And it would be ludicrous to claim that England is a democracy, but there are still those who make such claims so it's worth noting that these are not the actions of a democracy. But in light of what Edward Snowden exposed about mass surveillance conducted by the United States government and some of its allies, a lot of commentators from political, technical, social, mathematical angles even, have debated heavily the question framed uh, very famously by one of the uh, people from the country that Snowden has sought refuge in as uh, Chateau de Lat, uh, what is to be done? It was Lenny. I love quoting Lenny out of context. <laughs> <laughs> so, in order to answer that question, we first need to ask it in a better way, a clearer way, you know, something that is actually meaningful as a question. And unfortunately, a lot of the public debate around this uh, response to the revelations has avoided defining what the actual problem is. And it's fallen quite short in terms of defining the actual concrete solutions that we can, uh, can get at. So, the problem created by the existence of ubiquitous surveillance conducted by a state in consortium with private actors essentially falls into a few different categories. First, there are those issues which arise internally within the state in question. There are issues which arise externally in the public uh, international world. Then there are some existential issues that we need to deal with, and there are some more general issues with the more lar larger political trends, shall we say. So I've actually spoken a bit about the existential problem in a few other venues, including uh, SHARE. Um, 
uh, about the existential problem of ubiquitous surveillance. So I'm not going to go too deeply into that uh, here, except to say that in the time since I did those talks and, and wrote those essays, the harshness that uh, I put in them has not only been repeatedly justified, but actually shown to be uh, way too understated. I, I was being too lenient. Uh, but, you know, in short, the existence of ubiquitous surveillance is a fundamental threat to our society. And the best way I've managed to think about this is to think of nuclear weapons. So nuclear weapons have been around for quite a long time. They've been used to murder about 260,000 people in the course of human history. And the people who committed that crime have never been held to account for it. But having narrowly averted a mass extinction event, in part through actions taken in Berlin exactly 24 years and one day ago today, we now have roughly 10,000 of these devices in existence, nuclear bombs. And we don't know where all of them are. We know that they exist in a scarcity economy, though. We know that they're countable, and we know that they can be dismantled. The problem is that surveillance technology doesn't have this feature. Software, being not subject to the same structures of scarcity as nuclear weapons, basically they can exist in uncountable copies throughout the internet. We don't know where prison lives. We don't know how many computers are running boundless informant. And we might never know. And actually, we probably never will. Which means that for all intents and purposes, we must assume that the Cold War of surveillance is one that can never actually end. At least not through the telling of any iron curtains. The digital curtain is impervious to all of the world's Berliners. So, more kind of taking us down a notch, the people who built these tools haven't exactly been using them to kill people. You can't actually kill people with surveillance. Uh, but indirectly, these tools have been uh, doubtless used to facilitate state murder. So, on the other hand, the fundamental rights of at least 2.5 billion people have been violated through the creation of these tools. And within a narrow margin of possibility that we've not really explored yet, the creators of these tools will never be held to account any more than the creators of nuclear weapons. Internally, within countries such as the United States and the United Kingdom, the problem of ubiquitous surveillance is one where the distinction between the inside and the outside are lost. Uh, there was this episode of Battlestar Galactica, I'm sure you've all seen it, uh, since 2004, where uh, Commander Adama, the protagonist, uh, he states that there's a reason why we separate military and police. One fights the enemies of the state, the other serves and protects the people. When the military becomes both, then the enemies of the st state tend to become the people. Essentially, he's echoing uh, a sentiment more concisely expressed by Burroughs, um, when he quipped that a functioning police state needs no police. Or, uh, more recently, and less fictitiously, uh, Moglin stated in, in Westward, The Course of Empire, uh, that the military control ensured absolute command deference with respect to the fundamental principle which made it all all right, which is no listening here. The boundary between home and away was the boundary between absolutely permissible and absolutely impermissible, between the world in which those uh, whose job it is to kill people and break things, instead sold signals and broke codes, and the, con the constitutional system of or ordered liberty. Right? So, you know, this, this vast uh, distinction between the inside and the outside can no longer be maintained. And uh, essentially, the internal problem of ubiquitous surveillance is that it amounts to a refutation of the individual's ability to defend against, uh, or defend actions that the individual takes against government scrutiny. So it doesn't, oddly, and I've seen people claim this, that uh, it doesn't uh, eliminate the presumption of innocence, uh, which is formalized as a incumbent probatio qui decit qui negat, that the burden of proof lies with the accuser, not the accused. But rather, what this does is it allows the accuser to see all of the cards all of the time. And while some will argue that a just government will, uh, or sh 
should have the ability to, to be able to see all of the cards all of the time in the name of the prevention of crime, this argumentation breaks down when you address the flawed logic that you know, there's a presumption there that governments can be just. <laughs> so, once one makes that assumption, as many people have uh, in recent weeks, uh, one of my favorite was uh, Chris Blackhurst, who was a former editor of the Independent. Um, he, he said that, um, uh, that if security services insist that something is contrary to the public interest, and might harm their operations, who am I to disbelieve, disbelieve them? And this means that you know, any criticism of existing authority is automatically considered invalid, and any actions taken by the existing authority are automatically considered valid, right? So, there's, uh, in Robert Altmaier's book, The Authoritarians, uh, he set up three criteria for a person to be considered to have the psychological profile of a right-wing authoritarian follower. So, number one was a high degree of submission to the established legitimate authorities in a society. Two, high levels of aggression in the name of the authorities. And three, a high level of conventionalism. Conventionalism, right? So, he actually further goes on to state uh, later on in the book that most people seem spring loaded to become more right wing authoritarian during crises. So all of these behavioral characteristics are demonstrated in spades by these journalists and pundits who have been uh, most rabid in justifying the government's secrecy and denouncing those who would expose it as a crisis of confidence is unraveling public trust of the presiding authorities, right? In short, the internal problem of ubiquitous surveillance comes down to a question of legitimacy. In previous times, any government that was operating a highly efficient analog of the Stasi would be deemed illegitimate and undemocratic, undemocratic, right? A government that imprisoned those who were exposed wrongdoing would be considered rogue. And a government that was bent on preventing public discourse about, uh, you know, about things that are happening by sending thugs over to the print shop, the media outlets, to their offices with drills, drill holes in hard drives and set fire to the computers, they would be considered despotic at the very, very least. A government has no legitimacy when it spies on its citizens and lies about it very perjurously, as uh, Keith Alexander and many others have done. Uh, when they cover up systematic war crimes and throw those who expose them in jail for, say, 35 years, or hold people without trial for investigating leaked evidence of criminal wrongdoing. The crisis of modern Western democracy is the crisis of legitimacy. But externally, there is a diplomatic problem in the global international realm, because the crisis that was created by Edward Snowden's revelations are pushing diplomatic boundaries in ways that even Chelsea Manning's revelations really didn't. With Obama refusing to visit Putin, with Rousseff refusing to visit Obama, with Morales being forced to visit Fisher by the Portuguese, French, Spanish, and Italian airspace authorities. You know, really, if you had been cryogenically frozen during the Cold War, and then thought out in 2013, and had the situation explained to you, you wouldn't believe any of it. <laughs> in particular, you'd have a lot of uh, really hard time Rocking the fact that a post-dictatorial South America appears to be the most vigilant in the world in upholding the spirit of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, while Western European and American authorities are vigorously defending the exact kind of uh, activities that they previously used to define the USSR as the enemy. Right? It's, it's bizarre. It's mind-boggling. So, since nation-states came into existence, there's been a general understanding that every government spies on every other government to the extent that they can, without being overly aggressive, or at least not overtly aggressive, uh, without being unsubtle. You know. The diplomatic allowance never uh, was assumed to the extent to the general public, or to industry, or you know, at various times, various governments have overstepped those bounds and been given a very stern talking to. So, since the time that Henry Stimson, who was a, 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 a Secretary of State in the United States uh, prior to World War II, 
uh, since he claimed that gentlemen do not read each other's email, well, no, sorry, mail, <laughs> in his, uh, when he was uh, closing the Black Chamber, the, uh, an artifact of US military imperialism uh, that, you know, Simpson in 1929, he considered to be outdated and inappropriate. Since then, there's been a growing anxiety relating to the government conception of cross-border telecommunications. It's no small degree fueled by the globalization of trade and the concentration of the world's communications to a few hundred undersea fiber optic cables. So, the external problem is one of trust. The gentleman's agreement to conduct only the minimum amount of spying necessary to protect national interests and only on public officials of the governments in question, is, which is very subtly semi-formalized in the Vienna Convention, is there to make sure that allies can trust each other and that enemies can still conduct trade and that everybody can more or less get along. If you look at the, the history of, of European trade, it's very interesting that in World War I, the UK and Germany, while being at war with each other, were still the world's single most active pair of trading partners. It's, you know, the, the, the trust still exists on the economic level, even if it's gone on the political level. And when that trust is broken, it presents a real threat to international diplomacy. It upsets international trade, it makes the funding of any new diplomatic ties completely, well, at least way more complicated than it already was, and it already was quite complicated. So, the fallout of this is kind of becoming clear. Brazil is going to run its own fiber optics to Europe and finance the creation of alternative systems for email to contend with the American commercial offerings, while other countries are considering measures as far apart as trade sanctions against the US, self balkanization from the internet a la China, or overhauls of internal government communication uh, centers, which actually wouldn't be a bad thing. But very few governments are entirely what say about this, and none should be. This is very, very serious. Now, underlying all of this is a very worrying trend. Over the last decade or so, the pendulum of cultural uh, liberalism has swung back in many ways. We've got wars on terrorism, wars on drugs, wars on whatever, becoming more central to the global discussion. Uh, inequality has grown massively uh, you know, uh, by, by leaps and bounds, and well, quite frankly, authoritarianism is on the rise. But this isn't the crude, forceful type of authoritarianism that we had in previous centuries, where brutal measures were taken against all that opposed the regime. It's more of a softer, more subtle form of authoritarianism, derived from the right-wing branch of nationalism that we know as fascism. And in order to prevent people from rising up against them, the people must be subdued and convinced that the life they lead is not actually that bad, and it could be worse. When I was a child, uh, my grandmother always used to say, think of the children in Africa whenever I would do something that didn't fit in with the, uh, the argumentation of the day. And without meaning to imply that my grandmother was a fascist, um, I, I recognize that this form of discourse is a certain part of the cultural fascism that we've become accustomed to. So, fascism, that is to say, the, the um, close alliance between state and corporations has become the dominant political system of the world. Under the traditional definition of fascism, that is to say the, the old Italian 1930s, 1940s style, rather than the modern catch all of a two bits definition that we really like to throw anything under um, as a bus. But, you know, various aspects of how it came into prominence, in prominence uh, in, in kind of Western liberal, quote unquote, democracies. Um, through agreements, through diplomacy, through skirting of, of poorly enforced or entirely unenforced rules, both the explicit ones and the implicit ones, has led to it not being noticed by most people. We just simply didn't notice. The fact is that the, uh, this is the case, it has led us to a point where the likes of NSA are really inevitable, and so are the likes of Monsanto and Northrop Grumman and JP Morgan and Microsoft. And, well, you know, it's fascism. It's the perfect union of state and business. 
let's take a moment to understand that. Let's you know, not lose track of what we're talking about. Fascism in this form is also referred to as a mixed economy. So you might have noticed how uh, Nordic social democracy is all about the promotion of uh, mixed economies. But in practice, this means that the government supports certain large companies very directly or indirectly with monopoly rights, copyright patents, anything like that, land rights, procurement uh, grants, other types of grants, all, all of that stuff. But while this is happening, they're leaving what Blanca Heschrau called the Jeffersonian middle class in the gutter. Sweden, in this sense, is proof that fascism can be pleasant. Right? Uh, it isn't to say that it's all terrible, but you know, it's still there. And Sweden isn't the only one. I'm not just picking on Sweden, but we happen to be here. So, last month, uh, Diane Feinstein, a US senator, uh, she, she suggested, uh, I'm not sure if she was the first, but she suggested that if you want to find a needle in a haystack, you must first have a haystack. Uh, there's a justification for the creation of massive databases detailing now every aspect of an individual's life. Um, and in response, uh, uh, ex-FBI agent, uh, Colleen Brawley, uh, she wrote that, of course, self-righteous builders of massive haystacks are not inclined to point out that it's inherently easier to find a needle if it isn't going to pay. Pointing out the logical fallacy behind the argument, but not deepening our understanding of the internal logic of the governance structure where such statements are considered reasonable. So I'm going to define Feinstein's haystack as a problem that can be created or has been created for the purpose of creating the impression that it is being solved. It's a recursive definition. It's kind of cute. In order to retrain, uh, retain any kind of authority, you need legitimacy. And the most efficient way to gain legitimacy is to impress on one's followers that the role of the authority is justified and that the holder of the authority is necessarily the best suited for the job. So, through the creation of this kind of institutionalized make work, which it is, uh, nothing that the NSA has really done over the last decade has been useful, it seems. Authoritarian leaders are using this to retain legitimacy, even when the justifications are completely illogical. And once sees similar logic deployed globally to justify um, direct, if subtle, atrocities committed against humanity, not so much a victimless crime that is a crime that the victims won't notice until it's too late. So, let's run some numbers on this, because I like numbers. About 2.5 billion people are affected by the NSA surveillance. Uh, this is an estimation of the number of people using the internet in the world. A uh, number that can be expected to grow quite substantially over the next couple of years as uh, the next billion and the next billion after that come online. But to break this down a bit, the current estimates put the number of users of email globally at 1.9 billion individuals as a conservative estimate. Uh, 2.3 billion is probably a more likely reality. Facebook has 1.15 billion users. Skype has around 600 million users. Twitter is about the same size as Skype. And Dropbox has 175 million users, right? So there's over a billion Android smartphones and tablets in circulation. And there's uh, around 250 million Apple iPhones and iPads. And amongst the email users, uh, 435 million people use Gmail. 325 million people use Outlook.com or Hotmail or whatever they call it this week. <laughs> and there's 298 million people using Yahoo email. So the top 10 providers in aggregate are hosting probably around 70 to 90 percent of all legitimate email accounts. That is to say, not the ones that are uh, originating the spam, because we ignore them um, as a, a very large blip on our radar. So the top 50 providers probably account for about 99 percent of all email. That's pretty bad. <laughs> Further, 
during a single day last year, this is a uh, document from Snowden that tells this, the NSA special source operations branch collected 444,743 email address books from Yahoo alone, 105,000 ish from Hotmail, 82,000 ish from Facebook, 33,000 ish from Gmail, and from some 23,000 from other providers. So that brings us the idea that the relative internal security capacities of these core vendors you know, isn't actually that good. There's, there's all sorts of things being done. There's uh, efforts at Google, for instance, to encrypt the, uh, the dark net that they run in the back end and stuff like that. But, you know, and it's been known for a very long time that Yahoo has really bad operational security, at least as far as uh, user privacy is concerned. But that's just the users. Let's talk about the state surveillance a bit. So the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence in the US, their budget is about $52 billion a year. That covers the NSA, the CIA, the you know, various other little things, but it doesn't include US Cyber Command, it doesn't include the Office of Naval Intelligence, it doesn't include the US Air Force surveillance activities or the research done at the National Defense University or the National Intelligence University. It doesn't include a bunch of other things. It includes the National Reconnaissance Office. Right? Yes, it does. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, but it, it also doesn't include the, the surveillance done by the other Five Eyes partners, or Nine Eyes, as somebody said the other day, um, which would include Sweden and some other countries. Um, and, well, if we, I'm not sure about the Nine Eyes, but if we add together these Five Eyes, it can be, you know, it's not too much of a stretch to suggest that the total budget for surveillance is about $120 billion per day. No, per year. <laughs> per year. <laughs> yeah, uh, the other thing would be quite terrifying. So, $120 billion divided by 2.5 billion people, divided by 365 days a year, it gives us a cost estimation of about 13 cents per person per day. That's, let's call it PPD, the price per day of violation. <laughs> so this is incredibly cost effective for the surveillance states. Of course, a lot of the 120 billion are going to various tasks which are not directly uh, related to spying on the general public. So everything from keeping the floors clean at Fort Meade to conducting drone strikes on people in Pakistan. So we don't know the exact division of this, uh, this money. We have various ways of guessing. We have some information, but you know, really, um, even if we even if we were to have the good uh, decomposition, really. The important thing here is that they all factor into the same system of systematic human rights violations. So let's just use the total figure. And actually, it's way better for us to uh, do that for the analysis that we need to do, because it assumes that the capacity of the adversary, of the greatest adversary that we have, to be way greater than it actually is. Which is to say that the biased assumption that pervasive ubiquitous surveillance is bad leads us to want to overestimate rather than underestimate what the total surveillance capacity is. I'd rather be wrong in one direction than the other. So, of course, if it were possible, the, we would prefer to be accurate on this. But you know, the nature of asymmetric clandestine surveillance kind of makes it kind of hard to be accurate. I'm not sure they don't even know how much they're spending. So a lot of people have been asking, how do we reclaim our privacy? And the answer to that, I think, is an economic one. The global uh, surveillance budget is, despite everything, finite. And it is subject to a lot of real-world restrictions. It can't grow indefinitely. But we can raise the cost of each privacy violation substantially. So this requires a three-pronged attack. Technological development, policy advocacy, and litigation. The technology side is likely to be the biggest individual contributor, but we shouldn't discount the benefits of influencing policymakers and dragging offenders through the legal system. Besides, it'll be a bit of fun. <laughs> so the goal of those interested in protecting human rights should be to raise the average cost of surveillance to about $10,000 per person per day within the next five years. 
right? PPV ten thousand dollars. You with me? Hell yeah. This would reduce the effective surveillance capacity to about thirty-two thousand people per day. I don't have anything against those thirty-two thousand people, but you know, they're but that's necessarily a terrible idea. And uh, this, of course, is assuming that there's no budget changes. And uh, but what this does is it strictly promotes targeted surveillance and carefully planned target acquisition uh, instead of the broad catch-all approach. Uh, and actually, in reality, the number will actually be lower just due to the expected increase of number of internet users over the next couple of years. So there's going to be associated scaling costs with uh, doing low-level traffic analysis. So how do we get $10,000 PPV? Well, let's talk about litigation options first. The, the fine people at Privacy International, who you should absolutely support, uh, they're currently working on taking on the seven largest telecoms providers in the world to uh, take them to court over the issue of fiber optic surveillance. So uh, their argument is that they violated Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, in the US, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which we should also be supported, um, they're involved in multi-district litigation against the NSA and against various other parties, uh, both government and private. And basically, these two organizations are doing really remarkable and amazing work. But they do have limitations on how much they can accomplish. Um, Basically, there's a lot of stuff that they can't reasonably cover. Uh, if they have more money, they can do more things. That's kind of obvious, so you know, might consider contributing. But, but really, you know, uh, they aren't huge, and this is a huge problem. Uh, there's a couple of untapped, uh, untapped legal options that uh, basically suing various providers, such as Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile. Uh, Apple, Yahoo, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Swift, Barclays, ABN AMRO, uh, Deutsche Bank, UBS. Why so many banks? Yeah, it isn't just the phone calls and the internet that's being surveilled. But on top of this, it might be worth uh, considering lawsuits against the governments themselves directly. Uh, this would be way harder to do, but if we were to win them, it would have a very substantial effect on the situation. The reason this kind of approach is effective is that it raises the bar um, in making the various kind of entities feel, um, feel a direct bottom line impact on the businesses resulting from their collusion with state actors. So that will lead them to push back with more uh, efforts against, um, against the governments than they already have. Uh, to, their, uh, to many of, of their, uh, uh, you know, they, they are doing something. They, they aren't entirely living in a bubble with regard to all this. <clears throat> but litigation won't get us very far. Um, it'll only get us so far. There's a, a very large amount of policy work that's needed as well. Um, specifically, there's a lot of international agreements that we need to reconsider and renegotiate. Uh, Cross-border data protection agreements need to be looked at, possibly thrown out while we come up with something new. Um, we need to take the Westmore Agreement and anything that contains cryptography or re references to uh, dual use uh, uh, licensing and so on uh, should be taken entirely out of it. Um, there's laws within various countries that need to be improved. Uh, so data protection laws, laws regarding cryptography. Uh, India, for instance, needs to re um, uh, repeal their data escrowing law or a key escrowing law. Uh, which was oddly based on the American proposal that never went through. Um, and yeah, uh, essentially any uh, country that's doing PS going needs to stop doing that. Um, now there's a tax issue as well. This is a bit weird. If you happen to live in one of the five eyes countries, uh, then the numbers game gets a bit more complicated because you're actually paying for both sides of the fight. Uh, unless you're dodging taxes, of course, you're directly funding the adversary. Um, this means that if you start a company in, let's say, England or somewhere like that, and base it, you know, base it anywhere like that, and and you don't pull a double Irish or some other trickery to get out of the paying of taxes, then you're actually, yeah, you're funding both sides. 
And so in this sense, it's a bit ironic to say that you know, this makes tax avoiding companies like Google and Facebook slightly better. <laughs> At least they aren't funding this way of the state, right? But then there's you know, the technology bit, and that's what we all came here for, right? So uh, although the policy and litigation approach is really useful, they will not do anywhere near as much as uh, to raise the PPV value as improvements to technology. So technologists like us need to start before we go any further by admitting a couple of things. And then we can devise a strategy to succeed. So in the late 80s and early 90s, we would have been entirely forgiven for caring about technology. We were really busy then. We were building the GNU Linux operating system. We were exploring the reality that was afforded to us when we had control over every part of our computers, from bootloaders and keyboards and uh, disk I.O. and you know, things like that, <laughs> graphics adapters, graphical user interfaces, even Perl. You know, um, we were kind of a, a cool, nascent breed of people who could do pretty much anything as long as it had to do with computers. And the technology was really, really exciting. But we're a bit further down that road now. We've grown up a bit. And now we have to stop taking the political consequences of the free software movement for granted, as many of us, unfortunately, still do. So even those of us who are very politically aware, and you know, this is a, such a group, we sometimes make you know, very subtle mistakes. And uh, you know, we, we, make, we mistake arbitrary decisions about the protocols we use and crypto systems we deploy and, and whether to use zero indexing or index by one or stuff like that as being purely technical decisions. And OK, while I really haven't uh, quite fully comprehended the political implications of using red black trees rather than binary trees, uh, it is actually a well-documented fact that using ASM1 over C-strings has far-reaching political consequences. If you don't understand why, then talk to me afterwards. So, on top of that, and this comes back to a conversation we were having before lunch, sorry guys, we suck at design. We really suck at design. We suck so much at design that many of us still think that the command line is a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> and some of you will actually defend that quite strongly, I think. And don't get me wrong, I love the command line, I'm, I'm you know, really, I, I'm all there, but the command line is a language for people who care about technology. Good user experiences should not require users to care about technology. So in, in one sense, that really comes down to the crux of the problem. Many of us in the software movement care more about technology than we care about people. Sorry to say it, but it's true. Software over webware. That is a political stance too. So that brings us back to Lenin and what is to be done, Cheto de Lat. Um, it's funny, after I prepared most of this talk, uh, I found a bit of time to watch uh, what Bruce Schneier, uh, Schneier said at the ITF conference in Vancouver last week, and found that almost everything that I had to say had kind of already been said much better, and uh, basically rendered this entire talk redundant. But I'll still try and give you a bit of an outline. So, when that's done, please go and listen to Bruce. Uh, very important. Basically, moving everything that we control from centralized to decentralized infrastructures is the first step. Uh, this is one that a lot of us have cared about for a very long time. And, but it's a step that the numbers I've mentioned uh, previously about how many users various systems have really show that we've been failing it. Um, Technology really is always political, and even the small design decisions that are made by software developers can have really drastic effects on the political outcomes over the long or short periods of time. Uh, I'd like to suggest that software developers generally need to start developing like they give a, like give a damn about the society that they live in, which may be true of certain people in the free software movement, but, uh, but really it's absolutely insufficient the way we've been doing it. We, uh, and not just that, it's, it's entirely untrue of everybody outside the free software movement who, uh, who've been developing proprietary closed source 
software that we can't change, we can't understand, we can't use for whatever we see fit. So, specifically, I want to really rapidly attack the notion that usability and functionality are somehow at odds with each other. And the idea that presenting users with a half-baked system where they need to break up the and where everything don't operate within normal parameters you know, uh, is somehow acceptable. It isn't. Most people really don't care about technology. They care about doing things that are meaningful to them. They don't want to spend all day fiddling with GPG's command line parameters or figuring out whether their XMPP session is being transferred over SSL. We don't care about IPsec or AES. No, they want to be farmers or merchants or dentists or doctors. They want to teach our children languages or mathematics or something cool like that. You know, they want to build houses or spaceships or plumbing or roads or bridges or something. No, they, they don't have time to work with bad technology that we made badly because we didn't care enough about that. What's worse, when companies that don't care about those people either, give them a highly usable piece of software that doesn't respect their fundamental rights, most people will go for it because despite its failings, you know, at least it gets the job done. So if what we offer them as an alternative is not at least as good in terms of getting the job done from the perspective of a non-technical user, then it doesn't matter at, at all how ideologically pure our offering is. It just doesn't. So software that helps 100 people do something wonderful, it's absolutely meaningless if it's unusable by the next, next 5 billion in the queue. So bottom line, if you're developing software and you aren't developing that software for the benefit of all of humanity, then you're helping the fascists. <laughs> What needs to happen now is pretty simple. We need to migrate the next billion people off centralized infrastructures. Give them strong crypto, and we need to do that over the course of the next five years. One billion people, five years, that's, that's our task. Your mission should you choose to accept it. And we have five years at maximum, really, because if we fail by then, we've kind of failed totally. We must not fail at this task, because over the next five years thereafter, we need to expand it from one billion to everybody. Decentralize everything, encrypt everything, harden all of the endpoints. But that won't get us out of the fascism that we found ourselves in. Engineering our way out of fascism is a very necessary step, but it's not a sufficient step. We need to fundamentally restructure our societies, our governance models. But we'll get to that. Don't worry. That's later. This is now. We are technologists, so let's make the best tech we can. Thanks. I went to school with 
have this mindset, but they don't, first off, they don't recognize it as having this mindset. Now, very few people would uh, uh, you know, openly admit to being fascist nowadays. And, and to be honest, most of them aren't intentionally. You know, uh, it, it's not that people woke, you know, somebody woke up in the morning and decided, ah, today I'm going to turn into a fascist. No, there are okay, there are people who do that, but most people don't. So partially, you know, yes, okay, so one thing is we have a a kind of obligation to educate, an object an obligation to enlighten. Uh, but we also need to start, well, first off, all of you should read that book, The Authoritarians, by Bob Altmaier. It's free on the internet, you can download it. Uh, it is possibly the most scary thing I've read all year. Uh, and this year I also read um, most of Charlie Strauss's um, uh, Lovecraftian uh, novels. Oh, so that's, that's great. Yeah, it's great, but, you know, I, I'm saying the horror of The Authoritarians is quite uh, visceral. Because, you know, one of the things that that book doesn't do is tell us what we should do about it. And I'm not sure what we should do about it. Nobody has presented me with a good strategy for dealing with authoritarianism yet. So, you know, I agree, but I don't know what to do. So, you know, that's why I'm saying that focus on attack. And we should also yeah. do, deal with the other stuff, but we need to um, you know, do what we can. In the 60s, there was a slogan that might have originated by perhaps the hippies yes, or something yes. like this. Don't kill the kill policeman in your head. What? Kill the policeman in your head. Ah, yes. Uh, and, you know, it seemed like formulas were emerging, and then the whole thing got shut down. Yeah. Anybody else? Mm. Um, I was going to say, uh, you talk about the next billion people, and, and you know, this kind of thing here we're talking about, you know, decisions we make and, and what we care about and being pacified, but if we look at the, I'm just thinking of the analogy of like air pollution in China or something, you get the next billion people, um, there's sort of this hierarchy of shit they care about in a certain order, and when you're first coming online, you care about that stuff, you know, later you care about the stuff we're talking about in this room today. Yeah. Uh, but as I also said, you know, it isn't a victimless crime, all of the surveillance, it's a crime that the victims don't know about until it's too late. So what we have the capacity to do as technologists is to make sure that when these people come online, the things that solve the problems that they care about most, the, the things kind of, uh, say, further down on the Maslow pyramid, if, if that's what you're referring to, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the things that solve those problems for them should also solve this problem. And actually a bunch of other problems too, but you know. I'm not worried about those today. So they won't really know they're being solved for them. We'll be solving it for them. Right. Just you know, in the same know. way as they, when they come online today, they didn't until recently know that they were being spied on. Right. So you know, not knowing that you're not being spied on is actually a bit better than not knowing that you are being spied on. Not me. Love
movement going on in the legal field? I've actually found that hackers have an easier time talking to lawyers than they do to designers. <laughs> <laughs> some point during all of that we hurt their feelings a bit and some of them want to kind of change the image a bit. So, uh, so the project uh, that I was referring to is Shared Defense, uh, which has as a logo a kitten with wings. That's awesome! So, uh, uh, we're, we're checking out. Uh,